our fourth rent party, actually. Um, as you were coming in, I think you caught a little bit of Tommy Newman. Uh, he's going to be playing more of the Tommy Newman trio after the reading. Uh, for those of you who might not know, Tommy Newman has been a real standout at the festival for all theater artists. And um, I hear he often gets on at the dance. So that's going to be great. Um, and also, right now, uh, Arthur's up there getting our piece ready for afterwards. In addition to some stew he's making, um, Henriette and Austin made some dishes right from the garden. So, That's right. Fantastic. And I hope Walter won't be too upset about this, but there isn't any pound cake this time, actually. Um, <laughs> but there's two cakes I did make from scratch. All so, right. Wow. So hopefully that'll, that'll suffice. Um, we do have one favor we might want to ask of you guys. If you don't have a dedicated photographer available for tonight, so we needed a little help taking pictures. So if anybody wants to take any pictures and tweet them at us, then we will put you all in our scrapbook. Um, and also, I actually wanted to thank Kevin Michael in particular for making the connection with the speaker. Um, let me let me do wanna... let me do this before you introduce okay. Fred because it's a long introduction. But I just want to welcome everybody here to our rent party for LAPD. Right, it's in the tradition of um, the way we used to do it back in Harlem. Is anybody else here from New York City? 118th oh, Street. 118th Street, man. I'm from 111th Street, dog. You know what I'm talking about, right? So we have a rent party. It gives some of us an opportunity to get all dressed up. Because John won't never get dressed. Me and Mindy get a chance to get dressed up. Right? And, <laughs> this is true. This is true. And we invite you into our home. And the tradition of rent parties go back, I remember when I was a little tight, right? And folks would have rent parties because times was hard, right? And so the big money maker was the gambling table and the crap shoot. We can't do that. <laughs> All right? But we do have Scrabble. <laughs> <laughs> we do have Scrabble. And don't let Ricardo get you the gambling back there, Mike, because that's, that's when his game gets good. All right? But really, in that tradition, you have a resident intellectual, you have some local music. And most of all, you come into our house to have a good time and share in our good spirit. So please make sure that you sign the guest book and leave your um, email addresses so that we can continue to keep you abreast. Because I never thought, I, I, I'm a prison industrial complex abolitionist. And I never ever thought that I would join in wholeheartedly with a group with the initials L A P. Me neither. <laughs> okay, many of us did as I look around the room. But um, this is a wonderful community based organization. <laughs> so we welcome you to this house, and I hope you'll become fans like I am. And now, here's Mindy to talk about my man Fred. <laughs> Fred Moten has racked up numerous honors, including recognition as one of the Poetry Foundation's 10 um, New American Poets, and as a National Book Award finalist for last year's collection, The Field Trio. Among his other books are Arkansas, In the Break, The Aesthetics of the Black Radical Tradition, B. Jenkins, and The Little Edges. His poetry <coughs> has been lauded for its beauty, its innovative musicality, and intellectual rigor, and been described as a revolutionary whirlwind. As a literary critic, he works at the intersection of performance, poetry, and critical theory. And I hear he's as good a speaker as he is a writer. So please welcome, once again. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, if y'all can't hear me, tell me. I'll try to talk a little louder. I'm sorry I can't stand up. I, I, I am. Uh, no, no, it has to stay open because that cord is going to get messed up. I'm sorry, Fred. <laughs> but no, you gotta keep got it. Yeah, otherwise we're gonna get electricity from them. Well, anyway, I, I can't. Uh, I have to start with a whole bunch of apologies, and I guess I'm sorry about that too. Um, but I, uh, my leg is is all messed up. Um, 
so I can't really stand up. I got to sit here, which I feel bad about. I want some, this great tenor player named David Murray, and he was talking about another great, what they used to call Texas tenor man named Arnett Cobb. He talked about how he saw Arnett Cobb when he was like 77 years old and could barely walk, he said, but he was still standing up to play his horn. So Murray said, I never had any respect for anybody who sat down. To play his <laughs> so I feel like I got to, well, he's not here, so I guess he won't feel bad. <laughs> anyway, um, and, I, and I also, I wanted to read some new stuff, but I can't because my son got a hold of my computer and I couldn't print it out because he was he did something to my computer. So if I seem distracted and worried, it's because I got to go home and see if, <laughs> if he made if he killed everything. <laughs> I think it's okay. I think it's going to be okay. Oh, um, your son? Eleven. He just turned eleven. So, you know. um, I I thought that. I mean, I don't know, I feel kind of, usually I go to a place and give a read and I just stand up and just read the poetry and, and try to get out as quick as I can, but this feels different and <laughs> less dangerous, so it makes me just want to, makes me just want to talk, I guess. Um, but, um, but I should say, I'm going to read a couple things and then if y'all, anytime, if you got any questions or comments or anything, just stop me and I'll, and I'll try to talk about where these poems came from. There's one in particular I wanted to read. Most of what I want to read is from another book, but I, I thought of this, this, this poem because uh, just talking with Kevin Michael, he's telling me about Harlem and, and this is kind of like a, this is a Harlem poem or kind of sequence that's got to do with Harlem. But the story of it is kind of complicated. Um, so, <coughs> Uh, there's this great German philosopher named Hannah Arendt, and you know, like most great philosophers in the history of uh, Western philosophy, she, she had some black people problems, um, <laughs> i.e., she wasn't quite sure if black people were people, um, and that kind of runs all throughout her work. And if you are a black person who's interested in philosophy, then you have to deal with that. You know, you kind of go through it with a fine tooth comb so you can see if you can pull something out of it that you can use, but you're still constantly stepping over all this nasty stuff. She wrote a book called On Violence in 1970. And in that book, she is kind of just nasty towards the new kind of black student <laughs> that had emerged in the, in the 60s particularly in New York, in, in, in the uh, City University of New York, which had become an open admissions campus in those days. And, and she felt like, you know, um, that this influx of black students into the CUNY was gonna ruin our institution, is the phrase she used. It's kind of amazing that she had the kind of, I don't know what you call it, the moxie, let's say, to think of this institution as our institution, because she, you know, just come to the United States in like 1951, it was like that kind of, or you know, a little later than that, but or earlier than that. But the point is, um, to make a long story short, I have had this kind of complicated relationship with her, like a battle, like you know, you know, how you read something and it's written as if you, the way you read it, you kind of feel like the person who wrote this is trying to kill me with words. You know? mm -hmm. So I'm trying to protect myself from this stuff, and yet there's this interesting stuff in it. So eventually, I ended up actually—I actually went to her grave site, you know, huh. just so me and her could finally get this thing. Still, you know, we're working on it. You know. uh, anyway, so what I'm, she talks. There was a there's an epigraph, and I'm I'm hoping that the epigraph will make clear um, what it is that I'm kind of talking about. This is. So the first part of the epigraph is from her book called On Violence from that moment. Um, and then the second epigraph, the second part of the epigraph is from the New, is the New York Times article that she's kind of referring to in the first epigraph. So this is called Test. A small and still isolated incident in New York shows what can happen if authentic authority and social relations has broken down to the point where it cannot work any longer even in its derivative, purely functional form. 
a minor mishap in the subway system, the doors on a train failed to operate, turned into a serious shutdown on the line lasting four hours and involving more than 50,000 passengers because when the transit authorities ask the passengers to leave the defective train, they simply refused. And here's the second part of the epigraph. More than 50,000 subway riders were stranded in the tunnels of the IRT 7th Avenue line last night after passengers on a defective train at 110th Street refused to leave as instructed by transit authority employees. According to the transit authority, the trouble began shortly after 5.30 p.m. when the doors on a northbound train failed to operate correctly at 110th Street and Lenox Avenue. One man said he had stayed in the tunnel directing others to the exit to the 103rd Street. I acted as though I knew what I was doing, he said, because people usually believe you when you do. So that's the end of that. <laughs> this is how we never arrive. Infuse what we surround to not remember. Every day we cross from slave state to slave state in the barrack cars. We pass by to avoid examination in the sun. We were dark to ourselves when that bird started whistling in the tunnel. Making music we were made to follow, failed to legislate. Wouldn't get off, got off so hard we got off everywhere. Our breathing empties the air with fullness, and we're in love in a state of constant sorrow. The outcome is another process, a way into no way. The refuge is open and can't be safe. The mobile engineer put some alternate Dutchman pressure on. F trains stand for fuck whoever won't ride. Mm. The private investor's inability to afford himself is more and more clear as a general costly. M2 just going wherever they want to. People need to get to church and it's a bike tour. You can't drink that store-bought coffee from a flying saucer. The Anna machine is Henry Dumas stopping bullets. Wide interval Woody Shaw flying transfers almost all the way to Mermaid. The newly born instrument has a whole bunch of differences. Your refusal ain't unsustainable. It just can't sustain itself. You do what they say till you die like a dog. Too much stress on the impossible one. We stress this past the point to bring the history of getting down. Experimental slant can't help but hurt you. Look how hard and sharp it makes you breathe. You have to refuse in real time with things that revise in real time when the wind is closed. There's some ways not to love refreshment, but they all fucked up. We quiver with work and revival. We carry ourselves to you ready to hear what that sound like. Across 110th Street is a hell of a testament. The blackness of the witty partition be hand to mouth to hand, and the subway out of breath is an air shaft under a rent party. The rent party is the curriculum of the rent party department. Mm -hmm. The department was so outlandish and groundless that she was arrogant for cause stiff up in the face of the unadmitted as they exist on paper, in donation, in contempt of their training, though a citizen of Riverside, just up from Amsterdam, might not want to try to understand charisma. Like Kenneth Warren, she didn't know what African American literature was. Soul courses in Marburg were an expensive spirit and a waste of shame. Zalen was solo, unadmitted, and ecology of the supplement department the burnt fringe of speakers, La Coping Strata, bottom and jug off centering, everything, every good, every trumpet was deported by her voice, which was never more than enough from holding her breath on Riverside, where you can still feel the burn of the Eastern question. Eastern man alone in her caress, fiend and rub study in the desert, in the church of the unnatural. There's a riot going on and on for the making of black revolutionary stone on stone. That's the text. Yeah. Thinking about it because of being, you know, because of the rent part. And, uh, and it made me think again of, uh, I, have a, I had a good friend passed away a few years ago named Lyndon Barrett. He's a brilliant, 
literary critic. He taught it. Taught at UC Irvine for a long time, and then he taught at UC Riverside. Um, and actually, I kind of, I think, I guess, I kind of stepped into his job. Um, but uh, but he he's written, he wrote a really great book in which he talks about those Harlem rent parties and the kind of social life that kind of you know that emerged the out of which they emerged in which those rent parties helped to sustain. And um, so I always think of and he talked about them as as these spaces for people to get down and get together and eat good food and dance, but also a space of study. You know? Community. So yeah. So that's why I always think about it as the rent party department. <laughs> I really appreciated that. But when you said CUNY, the school, CUNY, CUNY yeah. right, the first thing that came to my mind was Leroy Jones. And uh, so, when, you know, I'm, I'm West Coast from Texas, but when I think of Harlem, historical Harlem, you know, Black Arts Movement, Newark, and all that. So to me, like, that lady, 1970, writing that book, but the energy that was around her, because we already know the stuff that happened at the end of the 60s, like the Panthers. Yeah. But can you imagine, like, how would she feel walking in on, like, Sun Ra and, like, Leroy Jones, like, really going there? You know, and then in her mind, it's violence, but in their mind, it's violence for them to not create, you know? So thank you. Yeah, no, she, that's what's so kind of amazing when you read the book, is that it's 1970 in the midst of, the, the war in Vietnam and all the this sort of vicious kind of you know police actions all over the world that the United States and other great powers had been committing against students against workers all over the world and her primary you know kind of example of violence is like black students you know disrupting a lecture trying to get some of their books in there or their yeah, their yeah. like lines and use and the English lesson plan. Yeah. But, she, but I but there's a way in which I think, you know, I'm not on her side, but there's a way in which I think she's right. I mean I think she rightly understood that that what they did, what they carried with them, was gonna transform her, hmm. you know, her the university. Okay. And and what's interesting is that a lot of people, you know, I think recognize that threat and figured out a bunch of different ways to, to neutralize that threat. Not necessarily not letting people leave the university, but, but maybe letting things into the university in a certain kind of way. Um, but, uh, but CUNY, you know, Langston Hughes writes these brilliant poems, like he's got this great poem called Theme for English B, in which he's talking about City College, you know, up in Harlem. And it wasn't just, you know, um, uh, you know, Audre Lorde and June Jordan and Adrian Rich, these great poets, they, they taught composition in CUNY at, at right around that same moment, you know. So it was all kind of stuff going on. It was like a real kind of people's university for a minute. Um, you know, so, so, well, I was going to read just a few more poems. I know I'm not supposed to go on too long. Um, Go, go. But we this is, uh, yeah. this is. I'll give you the sign, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh. Fred, this, what was the first book you read for? Oh, this this book, this is the latest book that came out, just came out uh, earlier this year called The Little Edges. Okay. Um, and it's a nice, I like the way it looks. It's my friend, I got a friend who's a great filmmaker named Arthur Jaffa, and he made the, he made the cover for this. It's like a still from the film. I will walk it over to you. <laughs> so you brought those books? Yeah, I just brought them because I to read from, you know. But but I got a bunch of them. That's great. I mean, I don't have anybody to read. But um, uh, that's kind of where I met Kevin Michael. We did uh, something for the Critical Resistance, and, and it was right after this book came out. Anyway, this book is called B. Jenkins, and um, B. Jenkins and my mom. And I'm basically like a classic, stereotypical black mama's boy. Um, <laughs> and so when she passed away, I wanted to write something for her. And I realized what I wanted to do was write, it's hard to, 
it's like, um, you know, basically, you know, she made everything possible for me. So everything I have, everything I am, you know, um, anything good, I would say, <laughs> was a function of her. And um, including people that I know, people I've met or people, you know, whose work I like to read. So I felt like I wanted to make a portrait of her, but it would be a portrait of all the people that she had made it possible for me to know. So if you know, you ever see those kind of pixelated photograph portraits, you know? So you, you get up close and you realize it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a series of little pictures. That it's like a mosaic. You draw back and you see a portrait of her. If you look up close, it's like these little portraits of all these other people who kind of, you know, are connected to her in a certain way. So basically all of these poems are um, just the, the titles are all names, and the names are all people that that she made it possible for me to know. Um, but the first and the last poem is called are are called B. Jenkins. So B. Jenkins, her territory sunflower, insurgent floor time in real time in the field museum. Bertha Lee and her lyric ways and her urban plan. Up and down the regular highway in every two-tone station, passing through the cure for preservation to unfold it all away. She put the new thing in the open cell one more time about the theory of who we are. In the names away in blocks with double names to interrupt and gather, kept dancing in tight circles between break and secret, vaulted with records in our basement where the long-haired hippies and Afro-blacks all get together across the tracks and they party. Everybody's sewn like grain and touched in stride. Now the, new, now the cold new reckoning is tired and you've been waiting for a preferential song. The multiplex should be in the frame like bodies in a house way back in the woods, fled in suspended projects like the real thing, posed for the midnight trill, essential shtetl of the world stage, born way before you was born. Move the administered word by breathing to hand beautiful edge around. Gail Jones, who's a great novelist. Um, my daddy drank red soda pop. Once he wanted a Fleetwood, then he wanted a navigator so he could navigate check out his radio towers, deliver flowers, drive back to give me long kisses, watch mama burn her books. Said Nancy Wilson can't sing, but she can style. <laughs> Hold back the force of random operators, return to the line, refuse to punctuate, a moon. But his actual drive was watching clay circle, tight breath hunch, tight shoulder, Sweet Nancy Wilson was just cold analytics. The difference between a new coat and the one with ink on the pocket. Calculate like a fat young minister. Stroking like Clarence Carter. Increase like Creflo Dollar. Mama and me stayed up over the club. Cried sometimes in the same, broke off the same piece. Left each other the last piece. Practiced the same piece. Got warm on the same. However, I'm so full this morning, I have to try to make you understand. Um, this is a, a poem called, some of these poems they have two titles. It's like they kind of start with one title and by the end they veered off in some direction that makes the other title necessary. But this, title, this poem is called Wanda Jean Allen the second title is Kendall Thomas, and the reason for that is Kendall Thomas is a, 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 a law professor um, in, who teaches in New York, and I heard him once give a talk about um, the, a case of a, of a woman, black woman, who had been executed uh, for murder in uh, Oklahoma named Wanda Jean Allen, who was uh, mentally ill and you know, just 
in many ways the usual typical and at the same time totally brutal in particular uh, evil vicious nastiness that goes on <laughs> um, anyway Wanda Jean Allen who was Jean talking to if she wasn't talking to the ones who were enjoying her abjection and the prospect of her death and her death the fourth and fifth fifths of Oklahoma the video refusal the open thing partially, the strife and joy, the I'm gonna kill something, the rasp and destiny of the servant girl, the C melody, the trusted one, the disavow and holiday and execute, the disavow, apologize, the whispering objection, Kendall Thomas. It's just really amazing, kind of chilling, uh, and at the same time, I don't even know how to describe it, but there's this video of Wanda Jean Allen, and people, they call her Jean. She wanted to be called Jean. And, uh, and I, Jean, like G-E-N-E, not G-A-N, not J-E-A-N. Um, and she basically, there was this kind of life in her that had not been broken out of her. Mm. And it kind of manifested itself in like defiance <laughs> and humor. And she had this raspy voice, right? But uh, but that's that quote in there. It's like she's like, I'm gonna kill something, right? Like they couldn't, you know what I'm saying? I mean, they couldn't. They couldn't. I know that it must have been so much more to her than that, but they couldn't get that, you know. No, anyway. Um, we know people like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is called Charlie Jenkins, my grandfather. For phase till one was left to let the others know. Past the underground song by Heaver and Curve, Ghost Stapler, Hayes, but looking yonder, keeping on the last crop was rich and thin. That big, but he was always just that small. Lean miles against the wheel till one, and here I am for elegy and underground, stride and suffer, spiced peaches almost bent too far for one last strut, the protest and a ride. Uh, this is called Alice Key. She was a really good friend of my mom's. Um, she was actually, she was, she was originally from Los Angeles but she ended up moving to Harlem in the maybe the 30s. And she became good friends with like Duke Ellington. Mm -hmm. And uh, she always claimed that Duke Ellington wrote Do Nothing To You For Me in her bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> and, she, uh, and she was just a beautiful woman. She couldn't, she wasn't like a dancer or a singer, but she was just so beautiful that she was kind of in show business off of that. <laughs> and, uh, and she was, like just to be on stage in a certain kind of way. And, and he had this show, Sophisticated Ladies, that went to Europe and I guess in France they called her La Petite Rouge because she had red, everybody called her red, Little Red. So, anyway, so, but she ended up coming to Vegas, which is where I'm from, and she uh, was like a really brilliant kind of community organizer. She ran she never was the executive, was a director of the NAACP office, because there was always some preacher who was trying to <laughs> not do nothing. But she sort of ran the office, you know. Um, and so anything that got done, she did it. Um, anyway, so this is called Alice Key. It's got two parts. Enter the scene. The short stairs from room to room, the increments of groups. Some people walking and a hand touches somebody's event, somebody's coat. Step down, rise behind that yellow sweater, fade like song. There's a gallery of octagons and the bands, a train of steps of open windows, frames wide matting and low running, maybe the edge of the water. The half grand up ahead in the street I started before you used to be. Open door, unclean corners, Lab, Labyrinth of Manchester, Andy Kirk, Andy Cole, chanting, K 
canter, noon to noon, to the after party. Hmm. The framed up trip of her name, the after party. I gotta make a call. It's a little alone. It's a little alone. This ain't my edge, this inside edge. I'm on the masked up rack of these sound events, like Edward posing in your bathtub, holds the shaft with an ear for painting, one fold, auburn rough, mobile an object through well formed, a moon. Mobile an object through well formed, a moon. A lot of the poems end up kind of getting connected in certain ways, mostly just in my own head, I suppose. But um, but this is called James Baldwin, and Miss Key kind of comes back in this too. But um, but I was thinking about Baldwin, and uh, I have uh, you know I just kind of like to I collect books. It's kind of like a sickness. Um, <laughs> but I had this. Y'all remember like Batman? You know, yeah. the old TV show I'm talking about. You know, sure. they had like their little library, and whenever they would go down to the back cave, they pulled a book, you know, <laughs> out of the yeah. shelf and then the, the, the thing. So I always had this fancy, this is when I was living in New York, <laughs> that I could pull a book off my shelf. It would just automatically transport me down to the street, you know, in Houston <laughs> Street or whatever, <laughs> downtown. James Ball. <laughs> hey, somebody. Some jewels lined up like hard flowers. Pull that one, jump the hidden balcony. The air get pierced and snared and soft down to the street and roll to finellas. The booming walk of gods all over, of goods all over the buckled street like Fred Hopkins. Towers peeking over the corner of temples. Somebody's window is covered by a book with pictures. Hollow circle and round edge scream and shatter the material. A whole bunch of ribbons like a choir. You can walk through the bookshelf to a bloody corner, pull phoner and that late wagon creek to the next dockery. A little dug out cave out there in the broad the settlement. The bow of a fiddle and broke teacup. A quilt made of grass and big old legs sleep in the other room. They shot her 23 times and hit her 12. <coughs> Woke up when her back collapsed, but that's all over now. The white on black like glare ride the shoe, the old new city. Mama and Miss Key and them whispering. If the phone rings, somebody's plan installed at cut pause, distended horn recall. This is the end of the open passage. Sullivan, Tuna Puna, that late night pan and workers party. The logical jam of their future and my present. Not only his bridge, but these other bridges too. The band spread out onto the audience, the cook sitting at your table, a little hard beauty swallowing eyes, home through the sharp rapidness of some notes. Yeah. Yeah. I just read a uh, couple, two or three more. This is uh, it's called Pet Curtis. Pet Curtis was this great drummer. Um, he played, he was a great blues man. Um, well, actually, there were two great blues men named Sonny Boy Williams. Mm -hmm. There's the original Sonny Boy Williamson who made Good Morning Little School Girl. Yes. And then there was like a second Sonny Boy Williamson who kind of ended up being more famous at the first one because he went to Chicago and he was on Chess Records and he had a lot of great music too. So I'm thinking about the second Sonny Boy Williamson because he had uh, a radio show on uh it was a it was a station that would play blues 15 minutes at lunch hour at lunch hour in Helena, Arkansas. And it was called King Biscuit Time. Because <laughs> they was the, the sponsor was King Biscuit Flower. Okay. So they called it the King Biscuit Time show. And and he had he played there with a, uh he played the harmonica too. One of his uh the the band was him, this great uh guitar player named Houston Stackhouse. And, a, and the drummer named Pat Curtis. And if you listen to Pat Curtis, he's playing this, this is like 19, you know, late, mid 50s, late 50s, but, and then all through the 60s. But if you listen to Pat Curtis, he's kind of playing this little kit. It doesn't even look like, I mean, it doesn't even look like a drum set that we would recognize. <laughs> but he was playing, basically playing like this kind of free jazz drumming. 
he sounded like Sonny Murray, you know, or like the most out avant-garde stuff that you would have heard in New York in 1965. He was playing that, but behind Sonny. Anyway, it was, he was great. Um, so, so some sometimes when we would go to when I would go home, you know, to Arkansas, my mom was from Arkansas. We would go driving around. We went up to Helena, and. Um, and I, I, I got like a King Biscuit t-shirt, I think. <laughs> so this is Pat Curtis. A little more edge, self-rising. All that edge and rim. Some other time you could walk the bridge tonight. Brush Hullama. Lula tap soft. That water hit and wash light off the ground. Every now and then. Step. Wait. There. Free accident, cakes and pies, low trimmer underneath a squall on the corner on a crate behind a toy kit. Lever of the trap door, of the trap set, hinge turn, release at the sidewalk, crack, slide to the levee, all the way down to the bottom, the bottom of the ocean. Self rising of this fall booms. I read one more. This is um, this is uh, this is John Thompson. Y'all remember the coach of yeah, yeah. George Thompson? Oh, George Thompson. Oh, yeah. And um, when they, dark brown glasses. Yeah, when they, when they ran, he was like he was six ten, you know, and uh, you know they used to talk. It was that kind of crazy thing where they used to talk in this basically kind of racist way about how intimidating he was. <laughs> But they were telling the truth because he was, <laughs> and the reason that he was intimidating is because he like wouldn't take any stuff, and, you know, and he protected his players. It's, it's like when Patrick Ewing played for him, Ewing had to endure all this yeah, evil race. stuff, yeah, you know, people making gorilla noises at him when he was playing, walking running down the court, and, and Thompson just would take his teams off the floor, you know. Um, but they had that one team with Ewing, and they had this brother named Michael Graham from uh, D.C. Yeah, he played for him for one year. And he was like, just brutal, man. Like he was just, they basically, you couldn't score on him inside. It was just not possible. And then they had this other brother named Gene Smith. Gene Smith was a guard, couldn't shoot. And it didn't matter. His, he was basically on the floor to just harass the opposing team guard, and he would drive them crazy. He, Kentucky, they played Kentucky in the semifinals of the Final Four, and they, Kentucky had this player named Kyle Macy, who's like a good shooter. Gene Smith, literally, you could see the dude just break down. He like, he just, Gene Smith drove him crazy. Right? So, and I always used to say, the, John Thompson's teams at Georgetown, they played like Snick. <laughs> like they played basketball like SNCC. They played, they played basketball like it was, like it was Freedom Summer. Or like, <laughs> the way they came. So um, anyway, this is John Thompson. Like a blacksmith, the all blacks are not any more than all other things are. The man who wears blackness well over his shoulder like a towel. One high fist is press plus essence. Michael Graham and Patrick Back. The cold frenzy up front like a Ma Jamal. Jonah Longmoo's edge and curve of black block move like Tony Smith, Saginaw, Michigan. Like Dimitri Chandler's sculptural sister and played with love like Gene Smith. Like fierce mourning, open to someone's loss and someone's gift and all up in Smith's chest, whose name is a locked set of Jonah's on Eakin's contact sheet, like Renee Gladman said. Like Smith was Kyle Macy. Like he was the new thing. The Snick Barrel House played fire soft like Sonny Murray's Moses, blown inside and down the black hand side of the left hand sideline. Like a Jim Hadar tufted boobblehead in a Johnny Cash black and off black onesie, an all black derby like Sonny Boy Williamson in Helena, smuggling harp like train, like Sonny on the bridge, like Black Knight falling, like Michael Graham on Sonny's time now, like Pet Curtis like little brother Montgomery, black block in our core, slowly curling out the blocks of new color, like Tony Smith, singing broken lines, then sleek burning, flying, 
breaking windows in exile like Pete Mondrian and Fred Oakley's keen-toed, angled, one-high-fist in black rib dress socks curling straight out the blocks in bright half-diamonds like Tommy Smith, like John Thompson's huge blacksmith hands, like Nora Nicolini. Hey.